Maternity and Midwifery Hour. Lovely to be here. I think spring might have come because the sun was actually shining today. Anyway, it is series nine and it's session six. So welcome indeed to this evening. My name's Sue MacDonald and I'm the curator for the Maternity and Midwifery Festivals and the Maternity and Midwifery Hours. And it's my pleasure to be chairing this evening session, which is going to be really Really interesting, I know it is. And we've already been talking about some of the practices we used to do as midwives. So that in itself has been very interesting. So I'm joined this evening by Dr. Wendy Jones, MBE, and Dr. Claire Maxwell. And because we always do this to our guests, we have to put them on the spot and ask them to share a little moment of the week. And they've been racking their brains, I have to say. So shall we start with Wendy and your moment of the week? Okay, my moment of the week was actually today, and it goes along with your feeling that spring is sprung. So I took my dogs for a walk early this morning um, up an, a local hill towards a windmill. Oh. And as I got near the top, the skylarks were singing. Oh, wow. And it was so beautiful and, and just that listening to that sound. And then this afternoon, I was out with my horses and got very tempted to take their rugs off and declare spring. But then <laughs> I thought I might be late because I might still be taking the mud off their coats if I did. <laughs> I love that. I have got a picture of these skylarks and the sound of them. How it's wonderful. Absolutely that really absolutely is a gorgeous moment. <laughs> Thank you so much, Wendy. Well, how about Claire? You're going to have to beat that now. <laughs> yeah, well, very, very polarised, Wendy. Um, I'm on leave at the moment and my sort of moment of the week was actually finishing Happy Valley um, <gasps> because I'm renowned for not finishing any dramas or any box sets and because I've had some time on my hands. Yeah, I have completed that. So I do actually feel quite proud of myself, um, although I'm still really frightened of, um, what's the name, James Norton, is it? <gasps> No, you no spoilers here. Oh, there sorry, might yeah, be. yeah, yeah, nothing, yeah. But anyway, that was mine. There might be some people who are here watching <laughs> who haven't finished watching the series. And for those of you who haven't, we won't do any spoiling. No, it's, it's very, you know, it's very exciting. I think we're all probably addicts to that, judging by the smiles mm. on everyone's faces. So thank you for good moment of the week and it, a good to illustrate <laughs> midwives. Though, and student midwives, when you're off on leave, OK, there might be some assignments to be done. There might be a bit of work to be done. But there's also a very important thing of looking after yourselves work to be done and doing some things that you like to do, not just the housework, the ironing, the cooking, the cleaning, all of that. But sitting, reading a book, watching Happy Valley, maybe painting a picture, going for a walk with the dogs or with the horses, whatever. That's really important. So I'll get off my soapbox now and I should just say to you, just to remind our audience there out there, and I know we've got people from all over the world um, and men, m many from the UK, but we do have our friends in New Zealand, Australia, Nigeria, Pakistan, Saudi, all over the place. So welcome again. Just to remind everybody and those of you who are new to this, the Maternity and Midwifery Hour was born in the pandemic as a way of getting people some information and, and some continuing professional development in an accessible way. So it's an hour a week and we've carried on. Um, and we're, it's everything's held by Matflix. And if you don't know about Matflix, do have a look um, online because they hold all of the presentations we have for this, for the maternity hour, but also the maternity and midwifery festivals. And if you're doing an assignment, a project, dissertation, anything like that, or mm, revalidation, very good source of information, really contemporary and up to date. And if you want something that's very focused, you can access the box sets for which there's a small subscription, but you can subscribe for a little while. You might get hooked um, because these are really good ways of getting information, the whole presentations, plus a bit of extra, which is done by Dr. Jenny Hall. She cur curates those and put them, puts them together. Really useful for you. So I commend those. Now, and there, all of these things that we do, like tonight, is free. And we love you to share. So tell your friends about this. Share the podcast, podcast if you'd like, or invite your friends to join you. 
and you do get this through on a recording so you can have a little group session and have a discussion about it I think this will be a really useful one to share okay I'm going to say a big thank you to our midwives our student midwives the maternity care support workers and everybody in the maternity services and the sort of allies of the, the maternity services and by that I mean the universities and other health services supporting our women and babies and families Big thank you to everybody for all the work you're doing, making sure there's high quality care. I know there's some sickness around because everyone up around seems to be coughing or got a bit of flu or COVID because that's still around. So take care of yourselves. And if you're looking after the unit because they're short staffed, thank you for what you're doing. That's fantastic. Now, on the news features, now there's still sad news um, from Turkey and Syria after the terrible earthquake last week. And they're now, you know, they're it, trying to look at the numbers of people who've been killed and trying to look at how to make people safe. And at least some um, aid is getting through, especially to Syria. I think it's been quite slow getting through the borders. There's been some little times of, of, of joy when they've actually found somebody and, and uh, I think the thing that we were talking about before we came on air was a mum and baby that were rescued and the mum had kept the baby going obviously with breastfeeding and that was lovely but it's of course we need to send our thoughts and prayers to people because it's a it's very difficult time for those people who've lost people or if people are injured or don't know where their people are that's very painful and very difficult if you've got any spare pennies be careful about sending them to any old um, requests that come through because I know there's been some scams going. So the best place is to go to places like UNICEF or UNHCR or anything linked up to the DEC appeal. And it doesn't matter if it's a pound or five pounds or 20 pounds. Any little bits of money will really make a difference to people there. So think about that. On a good news, sudden infant death syndrome de deaths have apparently dropped by 81% in England and Wales since the message to put babies to sleep on their back. And that's going back to 1991. But that's fantastic to think that 29,000 babies' lives have been saved because of that very simple way of caring for babies and telling mums about it. So thanks to the Lullaby Trust for that information. Mm -hmm. I also want at this point to pay a big tribute to Nicolette Peel, MBE, who died on the 2nd of February. She'd very gone, gone too soon. Wonderful woman, If for those of you who met Nicolette. Um, she's huge gone too soon but she packed a huge amount into her life she was a mum a midwife an ambassador and a founding chair for the mummy star which is the the charity that supports women and families going through cancer during pregnancy and childbirth really fantastic charity and our thoughts are very much with Nicolette's family and her many many friends of which she had so many and she will be so missed. Um, and there's a little bit of further information on the newsletter that came out today. So do have a look for that. And the other bit of news, of course, is last week, The Lancet published a bit of breastfeeding, the Breastfeeding 23 series. Now, I can't give you edited highlights because I haven't quite finished reading it. But and it's quite chunky, but it's as all these Lancet series are excellent source of evidence-based information and really interesting well written i mean the first one is entitled the unveiling the predatory tactics of the formula milk industry interesting stuff so we'll give you some over over this this period of time over this hour anyway so tonight funnily enough we are going to be looking at breastfeeding, just some different issues. And breastfeeding is a huge topic and it impinges on our practices as midwives and as, as people within the service. And we're going to look at some of the research and issues such as use of medications. So I'm going to start by introducing the lovely Dr. Claire Maxwell. Now, she's a Florence Nightingale scholar and she began her life as her career as a midwife. She ventured into research and she's now a senior lecturer in midwifery at Liverpool John Moores University. She won a scholarship in 2015 to undertake a PhD exploring bottle refusal by breastfed babies. And in two, 
2018 became a WHO technical advisor at the WHO Collaboration Centre, London, focusing on maternal infant health. So she's got a lot of knowledge there. She's also a BFI lead for LJMU, and where the midwifery programme achieved gold accreditation. We talked about that a few weeks back in 2022. So yay, well done to you and the whole team. She also undertook an initiative across the university to set up expressing and breastfeeding rooms for staff, students and visitors, which led to a successful application to the university to get a special mayoral award for breastfeeding. She's also got two sons. I don't know how you fit all this in, Claire. Both of whom she breastfed, and one of whom was a resolute bottle refuser. Wow. So we're going to welcome Claire to, to, to speak. So Claire, the screen is now yours. Welcome. Oh, thank you, Sue. And thank you everyone for attending this evening. So um, <clears throat> as Sue said, I'm going to give an overview really of some of the research we've been undertaking around bottle refusal by breastfed babies. And this title here is of our latest paper, and it's really what I'm going to focus on tonight is why babies may refuse to um, bottle feed. I just want to say this title here was, um, I can't take credit for it, it was a post by a mum to another mum on an online forum, um, and she's trying to explain maybe why their babies were refusing to bottle feed. So defining bottle refusal by breastfed babies, there's no official definition as such. It has been described as a reverse nipple confusion or nipple confusion type B, um, type A being when a breastfed baby is introduced to a bottle and sort of gravitates towards it. We came up with our own definition after speaking to mothers and experts in the field. And this is when a breastfed baby initially or continuously refuses to accept a bottle containing either express breast milk or infant formula. Um, two things here, firstly, um, it doesn't really matter what's in the bottle. Our mothers said that babies refused it equally. And secondly, there is a slight caveat to this now in that mothers have said that sometimes their baby did initially accept a bottle, but then refused it. Um, so it's a slight change. So for those of you who don't know, bottle refusal by breastfed babies is actually really big business. Um, a quick Google at the weekend. 2 million, over 2 million results. Um, and you can go through hundreds of pages and they will all be about bottle refusal by breastfed babies. Here, over 150,000 YouTube videos on how to get your breastfed baby onto a bottle. Here we have um, advertising by many, many bottle and teat companies in terms of they market bottles specifically for breastfeeding babies and here no more bottle refusal. Um, very much like the Lancet series, they target mothers. There's, there's a very aggressive targeting. I very quickly, if I go on my phone and put in bottle refusal, I'll start to get adverts on my phone immediately. And we have just started to do research around this and the evidence underpinning this marketing. And here you have individuals. I mean, I don't know if this person's actually um, being paid for this, but if you go on forums, people are making quite a lot of money out of consultations in terms of um, trying to get um, breastfed babies to accept a bottle. So why is it such an issue? Certainly in the UK, we know breastfeeding is not the norm and we have a bottle food um, feeding culture. So that sort of socio-cultural narrative that's been built around this drives forward that there's an expectation that your baby should be able to feed from a bottle, even if it's breastfeeding. A bottle is the default, not a cup. And um, we have a lot of babies that refuse cups as well. Feeding in public is challenging. Mothers going back to work um, and not always welcomed in terms of breastfeeding. And there is this unrestricted advertising of bottles and teats for breastfed babies. Um, and as I said, like the work of Nigel Rollins, you know, it's, it's very comparable, really. And bottle refusal has been pathologized, so it's seen as a problem that needs to be solved. Um, we would argue it's probably a normal response by a term healthy baby in most cases. And we mustn't forget there are times when breastfeeding mother wants or needs someone else to feed a baby. As one mother said to me, you know, life doesn't stop when you're breastfeeding. So mother's diagnosed with cancer in our study and um, hospitalized for up to 12 weeks, really, really unwell, not able to breastfeed physically. Mothers who are self-employed are the main earner. You know, they go back to work much, much earlier than six months um, or certainly a year. And then 
over 75% of our mothers just wanted to have sort of one-off bottle feeds for their baby. They wanted, you know, a date night or as one woman said, um, I don't really want to breastfeed my twins in my wedding dress. Um, there's exams. Um, one mother tragically wanted to spend the last few days with her dying father in IC. You know, there's a, a whole range of issues why mothers may not, um, you know, may not be able to or may be separated from their baby. So our research, I just must say, not all babies cry when they see a bottle of breastfed one. Some just, you know, laugh, almost smile and laugh when they see it. Um, 841 mothers completed an online questionnaire, and that was within just two weeks. So we had to shut that down pretty quickly. Out of those mothers, over 350 wanted to be interviewed. So we reduced that down to 30. And we captured about 600 posts from online forums in a month. And um, it was topic of the hour on NetMums, I think it was. Um, so you got NetMums, uh, Mums Net and Baby Centre. So tonight, I'm going to focus really on what I think is probably the most important area of our research. Why do breastfed babies refuse to bottle feed? Um, I think this can help, um, help inform mother's decision making the support and advice that they may get, and also their management of the scenario. And just to say we underpinned our research with a biopsychosocial model, and that's because it was really in recognition that infant feeding, particularly in the UK, is quite a complex area. So here are four themes. Um, I'm going to go through those. I'm going to give you some quotes underpinning them. And then I'll sort of centre them in the literature around them. We'll sort of do a, a support or refute in terms of are they a credible reason? So these have come from mothers and then we've sort of immersed them in the um, literature at the moment. So breastfeeding is the answer to everything. So it was just kind of amazing. It's fantastic how breastfeeding just seemed to sort every problem out. I pick him up, it's almost an instant calming effect and it's a very symbiotic relationship. It's not even that they're hungry, it's that they've just got to the point that they need to reconnect with the mum. He'll have the tiniest little feed and then he'll be happy again. And you think, oh, he just wanted that little bit of comfort and reassurance. And I think this really points to the non-nutritional rewards of um, breastfeeding. And there was almost like a psychological dependence between baby and mum. And the babies use breastfeeding for a quick fix or um, to check in with mum. And quite often they used it as a conduit to um, gaining mum's presence. And in terms of literature, we know that there's an increased um, mother baby communication due to breastfeeding. There's greater proximity between mum and baby and more contact time spent between them. It even you know, provides post-vaccination pain relief, etc. And this very much fits with Carleen Gribble's work that she did with older children when they explained why they breastfed. And they said, you know, it's when they were hurt or upset uh, or they, went, they wanted to be close to mummy. So can it be a reason? Um, yeah, we would say for some babies um, and maybe those who initially accepted a bottle and then realised what they could get from breastfeed and then began to refuse. So then bottle feeding an alien concept. He, husband, tried a bottle and sippy cup and she was not impressed one bit. She looked disgusted that he'd even attempted to give her milk in any other way than from source. Eventually, he would take formula from a bottle. He would not take express breast milk from a bottle. It was like, sorry, this is a mismatch. It's not right. I just think it's the alien concept that's something in her mouth that's not a nipple. He just couldn't work the bottle. He didn't know what to do. So I think there's three areas really that you'd focus on here. First, this biological expectation to breastfeed. Um, milk should come from the breast only and that babies are preconditioned and preset to breastfeed. And in terms of literature, we know if a term healthy baby is left post birth, right after birth, it will self attach to the breast. So it does have this prime instinct to breastfeed. Um, and for some babies, you know, this a bottle was disrupting this. Second, in terms of this thing in her mouth, so mothers really discuss the, the physical differences, the polarization between this hard, um, cold nip um, teat versus this warm, soft breast, and that um, it could be the 
physical experience of having a teat in the mouth and that's why babies refused to bottle feed and this was a bit somewhat verified by the dummy refusal that mothers talked about as well where babies really really would not have a, um, a dummy in the mouth either and in terms of the literature we know that um, you know babies infants children even adults can be very um, sensitive to different tastes and textures and smells um, and also in terms of weaning babies, you know, complementary foods, they, they don't always like textures, et cetera. So um, although taste wasn't implicated in this case because babies refused both formula and breast milk, uh, express breast milk, certainly the differences in the feel and the texture of the teat could be um, implicated for some babies. And then finally, um, in terms of not knowing how to work a bottle. So we know that there are differences in the mechanisms of breast and bottle feeding. Um, and in this case, it was really so, quite interesting that mothers said how their babies couldn't um, sort of master this skill of bottle feeding when it's quite ironic because in the UK, it's all about this mastering the skill of breastfeeding almost. And every baby's sort of it's a given that they're going to be able to feed, um, understand how to feed from a bottle. In terms of literature, there is a recent study, I've put it in the reading list actually by um, Katowski, it was an integrated lit review, and they sort of suggested that maybe there aren't the big differences that we saw in the past in terms of the mechanisms of breast and bottle feeding. So it could be a reason for some babies, but we also know that babies can definitely feed breast and bottle, um, you know, without any problems, it seems. Babies are individuals. She would not give up. She would not back down. Now she will take the occasional bottle of formula from my sister, but not from her dad. He suddenly just took it. I did nothing different to this day. I don't know why. I think we don't allow people enough to acknowledge the differences between babies. This um, very much stemmed from babies, individual personalities and temperament being described. And the fact that, um, you know, they wouldn't back down. It was this battle of wills and lots of mothers linked this to maybe how their children were going to behave later in life, that they will be the strong personality of the family. Um, and also this individual um, and unpredictable behaviour that you can see here. Um, in terms of literature, very, very few studies have explored weaning from the breast. Um, and it's usually with older infants. There's a really interesting study, I put it in the reading list by Marquis, and it was older children in Lima. And what they found was those who were labeled strong-willed and demanding were able to maintain the breastfeeding status, despite the mothers wanting to wean them off the breast. And there are also some case studies um, where babies, the, it's been sort of theorized that babies may have this sense of agency and want to be in control of the feeding. Um, so is it a reason? Um, it certainly could contribute to refusal. It might overlap with some of the others. And then finally, find the right bottle and don't delay. So these are all the bottles. I mean, there were hundreds of these that uh, posts. We tried Tommy Tippy, Mam, Nook, Advent, the Medela ones, um, until someone suggested the Mini B. She wolfed it down with that. So there was a strong emphasis on solving bottle refusal and that it, if you found the right bottle for the baby, then it would be solved. And um, this was really based on the narratives from lots of the bottle and teat companies. Um, you know, you find this the breast bottle in the world, no more bottle refusal. And the advice given on forums was absolutely prolific and it was probably paramount to advertising. Um, there's been no research on bottle and teat companies. We've just started to undertake some of the evidence supporting these um, products. Our previous quantitative study did show that um, when it, sort of mothers tried different bottles and teats, the um, success rate in solving bottle refusal, if you like, was actually very low. So it can't be relied on anyway, and you do spend a lot of money. And then there was um, delaying introducing a bottle. Hindsight's a wonderful thing, but after having my eldest, I realized the advice I was given by the my midwife and health visitor to wait until either six weeks before introducing a bottle to avoid nipple confusion was an utter load of, and, and this was a post. So there's two things here really. Um, one, in terms of delaying introduction of a bottle, um, likely due to this emphasis on routine and sort of medicalization of feeding, et cetera. Um, mothers being told to wait six weeks. Um, we haven't found anything to sort of substantiate the six weeks yet. Um, 
But what we did find in our previous study was that it was actually the later a mother introduced their baby to a bottle, it was more likely to lead to eventual acceptance rather than the earlier. So um, it is fraught with complexity because what denotes early and late introduction is very difficult to sort of decipher. Um, <clears throat> and also in terms of nipple confusion, sort of it's very difficult to prove this and it in itself is quite a confusing subject. You don't know whether it's because the baby has been introduced to a bottle that it's sort of gravitating away from breastfeeding or whether it's other variables. So it is quite difficult. I have put a Zimmerman's um, article in the reading list to if you want to read further around that. So in conclusion, there's no one definitive reason why a breastfed baby refuses to bottle feed. And reasons can be attributed to biopsychosocial concepts. They can be split into extrinsic or modifiable reasons, maybe when you introduce a bottle and which type of bottle, and intrinsic non-modifiable factors, which I think probably hoover up the most of these reasons, i.e., you know, baby temperament, psychological dependence. And importantly, this work adds to the evidence that babies are active participants in infant feeding and that this is something they do rather than something that is done to them. And that's by Gail Rapley. And there's my reading list. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you very much, Claire. That's really interesting. <laughs> I've learned quite a bit. And it's, it's interesting to hear these terms like sort of nipple nipple confusion which we use we use those terms so loosely but it's fantastic to have real strong evidence base so thank you for starting us off now those of you watching if you have quenched questions put them in now into the chat box and they'll come through for our question and answer session at the end so you need to give give us time to get the questions through so thank you so much claire for that uh, starting point now next I'm really pleased to be able to introduce our, one of the founder members of the UK breastfeeding charity, the Breastfeeding Network, BFN, Dr. White, Wendy Jones, MBE. And, and Wendy's been, was prior to that, an NCT breastfeeding counsellor and has been a community pharmacist working in GP surgery and pharmacist, a pharmacist prescriber on primary prevention of coronary heart disease. She left paid work to concentrate on writing her books and developing her website. And she says neither of work, which earn very much, but hopefully provide lots of information. Those are the links that are on the information pages that, that are available. Now, Wendy was awarded a Points of Light Award. That sounds lovely. Points of Light Award by the UK Prime Minister of Theresa May in 2018 and the NBE in the New Year's Honours List. 2018 for services to mothers and babies and she received her award at Windsor Castle in May 2019 from Her Majesty the Queen and Wendy's known for her work on providing a service on the compatibility of drugs in breast milk and has been a registered breastfeeding supporter for 35 years and says breastfeeding should be valued by all and medication should not be a barrier so welcome Wendy the screen is now yours Thank you very much, Sue. And, and thank you for all of you for letting me join in as a pharmacist in a, a really midwifery like forum. <laughs> um, I can't, I've, one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you so much is because I think midwives are the most important women a person to a woman when she's beginning her pregnancy. You are the people who she will bring her problems to um, she will talk to you about drugs in breast milk, where she may not talk to anybody else just because you're more approachable. You're having that individual face to face meeting. I've always hated over the years when people have messaged me or in the early days phoned me up and said, um, this lady is in the delivery suite. We think she'll be about another two hours. Can you tell us whether she can breastfeed on the medication that she's been on or she delivered an hour ago, but we don't know whether we can put the baby to the breast. And that precious time has been lost. So as well as being a pharmacist, I'm also a grandma to seven, um, all of whom were breastfed and um, took some persuading to stop in the majority of cases. 
So we know just the act of breastfeeding stops some women from taking medication. So even if they've got a headache, they'll go and have a drink or a walk rather than taking even the simplest of painkillers compared to their um, colleagues who have chosen to formula feed. And this is about trying to preserve breast milk as being the purest gold dust um, that we want to give to our babies. Um, my PhD research found that, found that over 50% of women had some kind of medication in the first five days after delivery. And unsurprisingly, most of those were analgesics and antibiotics. Just an interesting find. I actually suspect that it's probably more than that at uh, 50%. I think it's probably more like about 80% at least. But I entitled this, Breastfeeding Medication, Can They Go Together? And I always see there being an issue about risk when we're putting the two things together. And we always want to be very cautious and we want to keep both parties in this breastfeeding diet safe. And we're thinking about protecting the baby who is going to receive some of the drugs through breast milk. And the default seems to be it's probably safer if you bottle feed, having forgotten all of the wondrous things that breast milk does. And until recently, the BNF was really just a tool of the pharmaceutical industry, um, saying things like the amount of breast milk, the amount of drug passing through breast milk is very small, but the manufacturers advise avoid. Well, why do they advise avoid? And it's just because they don't have to take responsibility. Even if a drug has been marketed for 40 or 50 years, it will still say, don't take if you're breastfeeding. I have a look at packets of ibuprofen. My undergraduate training was looking at how ibuprofen worked. And that was back in the 1970s. I think we know a lot about ibuprofen, but that's still on all the leaflets. So tonight, I'm going to give you a whistle-stop tour about how drugs get into breast milk so that you can help a mum make a decision and you can understand some of the things I've written in fact sheets. And the reason the fact sheets are written is just to save you time. So most drugs just diffuse from the blood into the milk through the cells. Do you remember um, it's sort of A-level, it might even be O-level uh, science, where you have a membrane and you have a purple solution one side and it goes through the other side until it causes an equilibrium? And that's the same as how drugs pass into breast milk, except in the first few days after delivery, when there are these large gaps between the cell membranes to allow all the immunoglobulins to pass in to protect the baby. But Within a couple of days, these uh, gaps have closed up and now the drug has to go across the cell to enable it to pass into breast milk. But we give the majority of our drugs in those first few days. But that's kind of reassuring because at, the, at that time, the baby's in the midwifery unit. This is custom and practice. We're used to doing this. And everybody has a very, very different view compared to when the baby is three months, six months, three years old, when everybody seems to be much more reticent to discuss safety of drugs in breast milk. Drugs can accumulate in, in breast milk if they have a long half-life. Now, as a quick refresher, the half-life is the time that it takes for 50% of the drug to be metabolized. And after five half-lives, we assume that it's all gone from the body. But if the half-life is more than 24 hours, after 24 hours, we maybe have 85% left, and then we have another dose, we've got 185%. And after day two, then we've got a portion of the first days, a portion of the second days, and then we give another 100%. So it starts to reach a toxic level. And this is one of the reasons why giving fluconazole early um, after delivery worries me. When we wrote the thrush leaflet a few years ago, it seemed like every baby who causes mum nipple pain must have thrush. 
and we were giving out fluconazole willy-nilly. But we started to see babies being violently sick, really bad tummy pains. And it was because this level was accumulating. I actually knew of one baby that was about to have surgery, thinking there was trouble with the pyloric sphincter. And it actually was just the level of fluconazole that was passing through. If we have a drug with a large molecular weight, it's too large to get into breast milk at all. It's like trying to put a Lego brick through a sieve. It's just not going to go through the holes. And these are drugs which are usually given only by injection. So they are things like gentamicin, tigerplanin, insulin, but also the biological drugs. Um, and if they can't be absorbed from the gut, it actually doesn't matter how much gets into breast milk. The baby can't absorb it from breast milk because it still has to have the oral bioavailability there as well. So, you know, we can we will give the mum tycoplane and let's say she has um, a severe infection. Doesn't matter. The baby's not going to get any. But as I've already said, the BNF is not giving us much information about how to make informed choices. It doesn't give us any differentiation about whether the advice is different, whether it's a newborn or a preterm or a toddler or even an older child. I actually saw a discussion this week where a seven-year-old was still breastfeeding. The amount of breast milk that seven-year-old was likely to be getting was very, very small. So whatever the mum was going to take, wouldn't be getting through. The anti-TNF drugs, um, the biological drugs, are becoming much more widely used with chronic conditions like Crohn's disease, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, but everybody gets really concerned about the toxicity of these drugs, um, whether they are going to reduce the immunity of um, the baby, and if breast milk then has any benefit, um, because we're we're taking away all the goodness. I'm very interested in these because I have Crohn's disease myself. I actually haven't had to take an anti-TNF drug yet, though it keeps being threatened. Um, the only things with the anti-TNF drugs is that the baby can't receive live vaccines for the first six months of its life. So it means that we need to omit the rotavirus from the vaccination schedule. And as much as the baby um, being in, immunocompromised by the amount of drug passing through in utero, the live virus is shed in fecal particles for two weeks after the vaccination and the mother may pick them up in that time. So she either has to use rubber gloves when changing the baby's nappy for two weeks, be really, really careful um, with hand hygiene, or we just admit it. But exclusively breastfed babies very rarely have um, rotavirus anyway. So it's it's not such an, an issue. A lot of these um, drugs for which we use anti-TNFs are autoimmune diseases, which are influenced at least in part by the way we're breastfed as infants. So a lot of people who have these ones have will have been formula fed um, in the past. And that's what we've been fighting for the last 30 years. Most babies will have had some formula milk, particularly in those first few days. And we're breaking down their guts and allowing these foreign proteins to come through. So any mum who's got one of these acute conditions will do everything in her power to protect her baby. None of us want any harm to come to our babies. I'm found in much of the literature, it talks about the half-life and timing of drugs in order to minimise the amount that gets through in breast milk. So that mums are told things like um, feed immediately before you take the tablets and then don't feed for six hours afterwards. Well, if you've got a young baby, that's an absolute impossibility. And it's actually 
completely irrelevant because any drug that you take for more than five half-lives again will have reached a peak which will stay there all of the time. Um, you'll get slight peaks and troughs, but it pretty much reaches a steady state. So I've had things like mums told um, to avoid sertraline, uh, avoid breastfeeding after they've taken sertraline for four to five hours. Now, they will then try and take it before their longest sleep. And they'll usually take it at night time, assuming the baby is going to sleep longer for, at night time. And we know they very much don't do that. But what if the baby does normally sleep for four hours, but on this time, it's teething and wakes unexpectedly. Is she going to breastfeed? Is she going to try and stop the baby from feeding for longer? Um, this is just going to add to her anxiety and depression for absolutely no reason at all. So the only reason that we would try and time feeds is in the, uh, an acute medical situation, but not in a chronic situation. The relative infant dose is probably one of the, the most useful um, pieces of information. It doesn't appear in the BNF. It only occurs in, in specialist sources. And the relative infant dose of less than 10% is considered compatible with breastfeeding. It was first introduced back in 1996, but it was has been widely used by Hale. But we can't use it just by itself. We need the full picture because things like methotrexate have a very low relative infant dose. But if we're using them continuously uh, to treat rheumatoid arthritis, it's not compatible with breastfeeding. Mums with perinatal mental health were asked what do they want professionals to know um, about how their mental health challenges could be assisted or made worse. Um, and the thing they came back with was saying stopping breastfeeding can make things worse. Whereas actually too many times we're told that the pressure to breastfeed, which is what causes the perinatal mental health problems. And if you've got um, a professional then saying, well, you could take this, but some of it will get through to your your baby, it can be very scary. When you stop breastfeeding, you can actually have um, an increase in depression and anxiety because you're losing the oxytocin benefits, which is helping you to relax, sleep more deeply, um, faster. So the most important thing, I think, is that women should be involved in the discussions about whether they can breastfeed or not. They should be given information in a manner which they can understand um, and actually about how much is going to get into breast milk rather than being told you must stop breastfeeding because the BNF says that there's no information or the manufacturers that advise avoid. There's actually much more information around out there than, than the BNF is going to provide for us. And having a medication is part of their choice. If they believe very strongly that breastfeeding is part of their way of mothering, telling them to stop can be very detrimental. So very quickly, a few of the situations that you may come across, and I'm sorry if it feels like this, I'm teaching my grandmothers to suck eggs. I can't think of any antibiotic that a breastfeeding mum can't take. We always used to think that metronidazole affected the taste of breast milk, and that's come down through history. But I can't find where this originated. And I've wondered whether it was because the original manufacturers of uh, metronidazole, it was under the brand name of Flagyl and it was bright yellow. And I wonder if some of the bright yellow colour came through and somebody looked at it and go, that doesn't look very nice. I bet it tastes horrible. But toddlers have said um, that actually if uh, you eat foods rich in garlic, it masks the taste of anything. So if you've got a mum who's taking metronidazole, tell mum to go and have a nice bag bowl with plenty of garlic in and there won't be taste of any drugs in there. 
Tomoxiclav and erythromycin seem to cause more stomach pains and more vomiting in babies. Don't really know why. Um, it is just happens. But if nurms know that this is going to happen, at least they're warned that the baby isn't having some strange reaction that they need to seek medical attention. And remember to remind mum that she's passing on antibodies and that she can't transfer her infection through breast milk. The social media forums are full of, if I'm breastfeeding, I'll pass COVID to my baby through my breast milk. No, you won't. You may pass COVID because you sneeze over your baby or you cough over your baby, but you're not getting it through breast milk. And most breastfed babies caught COVID in such a mild manner that they didn't care. Their mums might have been feeling poorly, but they weren't. We've often used labetalor because we use it antenatally, but you need to be alert for white nipples after a feed because labetalor cuts off the blood supply to extremities. So you might notice these very white nipples, um, in which case it's not the drug for her. If you're going to use an ACE inhibitor, which would always be my drug of choice, use an Alapril because it's got the most evidence behind it and we give it to children. And this relative overdose is so far below 10%. Um, we use nifedipine for Raynaud's phenomenon, which I seem to have seen a lot of this winter. But we want to avoid diuretics um, because they're going to decrease the fluid that's in the mum's body and may lower her milk supply. Pain relief is part of your daily business. The MHRA are still recommending that we shouldn't use codeine during breastfeeding because of the changes in maternal metabolism. But if she's taken an accidental dose because her husband has brought her two painkillers and actually they were cocodamol rather than paracetamol, it doesn't mean she has to stop. Um, One-off dose isn't going to, to do any harm. The opioid of choice is dihydrocodine or um, morph oral morphine because both of them have substantial first class pass metabolism. And remember, particularly if they've got um, hemorrhoids, they can have laxatives too. The laxatives don't get into breast milk. Um, stool softeners do that, just soften the stools, which I always remember the fourth stage of labour as being far more painful than the first stage of labour. Um, so reassure them that they can have a laxative if they need to. And remember, as Claire said, sometimes babies refuse to take a bottle. And if we suddenly tell a mum to stop breastfeeding, she may risk mastitis. The baby may become intolerant of cow's milk protein um, with just a few things. So trying to do no harm, we may actually cause more harm. And the mum may have to re-stimulate her milk supply afterwards. The resources, we'll have, you'll have a list of as well. I have to say my books, they, as I said, they don't make a lot of money, but they became grandma's boasting books because both those are my daughters and grandchildren on the front of them. Very whistle stop. I could go on for hours, but if you need to answer me a question, I'm never very far away. So you can email me or contact me via the Facebook page. I'm there to try and help you help mums. And thank you for all you do. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Wendy. Do you know, I'd like you in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'd fit, Sue. <laughs> Possibly not. But I, I think I, I'll reiterate that both Claire and Wendy have provided some fantastic resources that are available on, on the resources sheet that we put on on uh, Facebook. So do avail yourself of uh, those that information, because I, I could listen to both of you all evening, I have to say, because the sort of messages you're giving and the information is so sensible and so positive about breastfeeding it's lovely and and really useful but I and, and Wendy I think I'm thinking gosh I wish I'd known that I wish I'd known that when I was a student I wish I'd known that with a I was doing in on the ward who really important anyway 
we have questions coming through. Now, why I'm looking away every now and then is because I have two screens. <laughs> and there's some questions come through. Now, if you've got any questions, no matter how small, how big, throw them into the, the chat box and, and I can field them to uh, Wendy and Claire. But the first question is to Claire, um, and it's from Jacqueline Richards. Hi, Jacqueline. And Jacqueline wants to know, she says, Dr. Dr. Maxwell, hi. Please, can you elaborate on where your research may have implications for the use of nipple shields? Widely used in practice, but poorly evaluated in studies, it seems. That might be quite a big question, actually, Jacqueline. Yeah, um, <clears throat> some others did talk about nipple shields, very few, actually. And when they talked about them, it, it was unfavourable and it was very much, they aligned them a bit to the use of a dummy um, and a refusal of that sort of texture and that feel of a nipple shield. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, in terms of that, there probably is nipple shield refusal as well. Um, I don't know whether that's what Jacqueline's asking, but yeah, but um, Jacqueline, there's work to be done on that, I think. Oh, if, there we are, a little, yeah. a little project coming. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. Well, Jacqueline's asking another question and she says, is there a definitive guidance on antipsychotics? No, that's Wendy. Sorry, sorry. Wendy. Wendy. Sorry, yeah. sorry. Is there a definitive I was trying guidance? to make a connection there. <laughs> no, sorry, that completely my fault. I'm, I'm so sorry, Jacqueline. So it goes, Dr. Jones, hi, is there definitive guidance on antipsychotics? Some of the advice seems inconsistent in practice. I wonder what Wendy I, say. <laughs> I think often we may be not looking at the evidence-based information. And sadly, often a view that a mum needs to sleep if she has psychosis. Um, and therefore, the breastfeeding is not beneficial. But we can't ever forget that poor lady in Bristol who gave birth to her baby and chose to not take her antipsychotics in order to breastfeed and was found over a cliff with her baby. Mm -hmm. So yes, there, there is information, there is evidence-based information. Um, the only one that's I've seen cause major problems is aripiprazole, which tends to stop breast milk in its tracks. It's a wonderful and very effective drug, um, but it does stop milk supply. OK, thank you for that. That's fantastic. And Mary, hi, Mary, says, thank you for the interesting talks. Not a question directly about drug interaction with breastfeeding, but is there much evidence on the use of galactogs, e.g. Domperidone? <laughs> Yes, there's quite a lot of information, but it is restricted to use in the neonatal period, particularly when mums are pumping long term. Mm. But there has recently become come some information about the way women can withdraw from it if they've been taking the very high dosages that have been recommended um, from Canada and mm. that sometimes women have struggled very much to come off these and become suicidal, severely depressed. Um, so it's a huge, big minefield. The other galactagogues like fenugreek um, and oats and things, there's very little research behind. But we can always rely on a placebo effect because if you're told eating oat biscuits is going to increase your breast milk supply, I'm good with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, in my day, it used to be something called lemon and sugar. I don't know if you've heard of that, where you had, I think it was something like two tablespoons of sugar mixed in enough lemon juice to be just about palatable. And this was meant to burst your, you make, you produce massive amounts of milk. I don't know whether it was the sugar content of that. I don't know. You look completely blank. This is, no, I've not <laughs> heard of that one. But, but you know, if somebody tells you with confidence that something is going to work, whether it's drink more water, um, so long as it goes along with frequent effective feeding, yes. then it will work. Yes. The mind <laughs> is a very powerful thing. Well, that's that's true enough. That's true enough. I'm thinking about those 
very determined babies now of, of Claire's. <laughs> no, and I, I, I just, I, I was wondering what is the next piece of work from Claire linked up with this, this breastfeeding research that you've been doing? Well, because it feels as though there's a next step here. Oh, yes, there's lots. <laughs> Always. Um, so there's two things we're looking at. One thing we're looking at is the scoping review. Um, we're doing it with colleagues in Switzerland. And this is in terms of alternatives to bottle and breast. Um, so if a mother wants to use, um, you know, she, she is separated from her baby, etc. What can she use with a term healthy baby? Because at the moment, the default is a bottle, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we're doing a scope and view, collecting all the data on, um, you know, syringe, dropper, all sorts of nifty, all sorts of things that are all well, paladai, et cetera. And then, so we should have that together soon. And then the other area, obviously, is the marketing and the evidence supporting these teats and bottles that are targeted at breastfeeding mothers. Um, a bit sort of in line, obviously not to the dizzy heights of Rollins, but very much in line with the way that formula milks are marketed. Mm. I mean, that's fascinating, really, I mean, because I'm, I'm not sure that the professionals are always as aware of the, 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 the kind of issue of marketing and, and women looking for help and then being bombarded with all of this advertisement. And of course, you'd be very tempted if you could see the answer to your problem there. It's popped up in your inbox or on your phone. You, you're more likely to go and buy it, aren't you? And they make it so easy. Yeah. Right. And, oh. and, and I think that the first step is nutrition information about that mark a formula manufacturers are actually looking for solutions to problems of sleep and wind and vomiting that is what women struggle with mm. so yeah you have a problem we'll tell you there's a product <laughs> except just keep on frequent uh frequent feeding and just cuddling i love the the um the, the quote from one of the mums that, that, that just needed a little breastfeed to make him feel better. It was so lovely. It was lovely. Mm -hmm. OK, I've got another question. Carol Goddard. Hi, Carol. A uh, question for Wendy, please. More on Galacto. Galactago, because I'm never going to even be able to pronounce <laughs> the name. Everyone talks about fenugreek, but there may be links to reduce lactation from using fenugreek, possibly linked to diabetes. Can you expand yeah. on this, please? Whoa, Benny Greek is it, <laughs> Benny Greek is is not as simple as you would think. Uh, we tend to think of herbs as being mm. innocuous because mm. they're from natural products. And yes, we do put fenugreek in, into curries, but in very different quantities to what people are taking. Um, and it can increase bleeding. It can cause asthma. It can or alter sugars. And for some women, it does decrease their milk supply. Um, I am not a fan, I have to admit. I'm just trying. So you're saying that there's a there must be a tablet with fenugreek in it, in high yes, levels. There are, there, yeah. And what it was it meant to do? It's so it's, 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 the galactagogues is, is meant to increase drugs and uh, herbs to increase milk supply. Oh, okay, okay. So it's um, so okay. yeah. Got it. All the, these things about all the women who believe that they have a low milk supply are looking ah. again for a magic wand. Um, and fenugreek is something that they can go out and ah, buy. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, okay, but it's it's not as and the evidence base behind it being effective is is very low as well. Okay, well, that's great. Thank you. Very clear. I think lemon and sugar might come back. <laughs> <laughs> and Jacqueline, Jacqueline is a busy lady. Ja Hi, Jacqueline again. <laughs> Observation rather than question. The comments on diuretics is interesting, as some of the dehydrated and severely malnourished babies I saw in resource poor settings in Nepal convinced me that this is also an area that needs more research. Well, that's a good point, Jacqueline. That's a good point. OK, because it's obviously affecting in different ways. Now, I want to know from Wendy, you're, you've got these wonderful fact sheets. Which is the best one? <laughs> Or the most popular Ooh. one. Pop, most popular one. And the most popular one is always painkillers. Ah, okay. Because it affects um, a woman from delivery right through to when she stops breastfeeding. So she might have a back pain issue. She might have um, toothache. 
it may be nothing to, to do with her birth, but she might have postnatal pains as well. So all the way through, right. there is a need for painkillers. And social media is a, alive with people suggesting things to each other. <laughs> I think I need your your fact sheet, I think. <laughs> no, that's grand. OK, I just thought there was another question coming through, but I'm not sure there is. <laughs> oh, another comment. This is a comment. Thank you very much. This is mm -hmm. Areej from South Africa. Hi, Areej. <laughs> and she's saying um, fenugreek is heavily used by postpartum women in South Africa. Well, now you know there's more information on this. You need to get Areej. So have a look at the resources and have a look at the um, information there that you can get. Now, the, the hour's gone so quickly. We've finished the hour. And thank you so much to Claire and Wendy for joining us. I think we'll have to have them again. I was being a bit sneaky because I was finding out from Claire is that we, we can <laughs> carry on the story. And then, Wendy, I think we can get lots and lots of information because you've obviously got a source of massive information that's really useful to us as midwives. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. And thank you to everybody who's joined us also. Now, this will come out a bit later in the week. And also for those of you who like a, a first thing in the morning, a podcast, it's out at six o'clock in the morning on Friday. So you can listen to it as you're doing your running or your keep fit activities. So thank you also for Claire and Wendy and to Amy, who's behind the scenes. And she'll be editing this into a beautiful way for us. And Paul, who was fielding the questions. And thank you to everybody for joining us. Um, and next week, we're looking at perinatal mental health. So we sort of touched on some of that. We're looking a bit about psychosis. And um, so I'm looking forward to that next week. Don't forget to book for Safer Beginnings Conference for Healthcare Professionals in um, that's Best Beginnings and White Ribbon Alliance, 3rd of March in London, 10th of March in Manchester. And don't forget All Ireland Festival in Dublin on the 18th of April, if you'd like to join us there. Or if you haven't got any time until um, May, 16th of May, Midlands Festival will be there. So, and in the meantime, stay safe, take care of yourselves, and we'll see you next week. Same place, same time. <laughs>